Hello, I'm Denise Cross White Hater, currently representative for House District 41, and I'd like to be reelected in November. I hope I am. Thank you. Representative Cross White Hater is an A plus, an A plus rating with our OK2A, okay so uh, make sure you get her back. Good evening. My name is Emily Delosier. Uh, I'm running for Senate in District 10. I want to thank, uh, well, I, I miss Sean. Uh, he was, uh, or he still is in our Osage County Republican Party, where I was uh, the chairman for a while. And Wayne Hill is the current chairman. I think we all need to vote for them. They're solid people. I'm a Christian, a wife, a mother, a grandmother, and a patriot in that order. And I'm running against a senator who had voted against an anti-abortion bill and voted for giving illegal aliens a uh, driver's license. I'm like, what's next? Does that come with a voter registration? So uh, you may not be in my district, but get the word out. I'm here and I'm here to stay. Thank you. County Commissioner Mark Hader. Yeah, you, come on up here. You know your name. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know who you are. Yeah, I'm Canadian County Commissioner uh, Mark Hader. I hope I'm not treading on Oklahoma County's uh, turf here necessarily, but um, I'm running for re-election. I ran eight years ago, and I, I told people I was a Christian, constitutional, conservative Republican in that order for a purpose, and that I wanted to do the job with as much excellence as possible, and then get out of your way and let you achieve the American dream, or, or succeed or fail in it. So I hope... Uh, if you want to, help me uh, continue that fight. Another candidate for treasurer is State Representative uh, Todd Russ. He has an A-plus rating with the Oklahoma Second Amendment Association. And you may not think a treasurer's position is very much, but folks, they handle the money. So it's an important position. He's, he's, we've trusted him with OK2A for years. You should be able to trust him. Representative Todd Russ, would you come on up here just for a moment, sir? Thank you, Don. Good to be here. Good to see everyone. I think most of the people in the room I've seen somewhere two or three times already. It's good to be by here and get to say hello. Uh, I am Todd Russ. I'm running for state treasurer. Uh, I, I am certainly a constitutive cons conservative Christian and uh, believe in uh, limited government and less regulations. I will tell you I spent uh, 25, 30 years as a small town community banker. Uh, if you listen to the talk shows, they tell you to worry about the big banks and be friends with your little banks and uh, I've got the, the record on the numbers and uh, state government appropriations committee. So I'm running for state treasurer and I uh, hope you'll uh, vote for me come June 28th. Thank y'all. Hi, I'm Judge Nikki Kirkpatrick and I was appointed by Governor Stitt um, one year ago today. So today is my anniversary. And I have recently, um, I have been on the criminal docket for the last three months, but, um, and I was a longtime prosecutor before that, prosecuted for over a dozen years, uh, everything from domestic violence to homicide, uh, crimes against um, elderly and consumers, so, uh, you know, issues of, of business and taking care of our community, keeping our community safe is so important to me, and, um, and so I've done a little bit of everything. I've got to do probate and guardianships and adoption law civil law, and now I'm on the criminal docket, and my primary concern is to make sure that our communities are safe, that we have what we need to make sure that law enforcement um, can do their job, that, that they're effective in their, in their ability to present cases, and that we can take dangerous criminals off the street, and make sure that we can um, and get the help for those who need it, and those who don't, um, but are, need to be taken off the street, that they can be. And so it is very important to me to be able to continue this position. I've recently drawn a challenger, um, that someone, uh, actually two challengers, they're both Democrats, and they think that criminal justice reform looks like turning all the captives free and letting everybody out, and that concerns me. So I'm, I'm ready to um, hunker down, follow the law, do what we're supposed to do, give mercy to where mercy is due, and to, um, to bring accountability where accountability is due. So I would love your vote. Um, June 28th is the, is the primary, and there will be a primary election where all three candidates are on there, but I really appreciate everybody's vote. Um, Rand Eddy, and they've been suing OCPD and all the other law enforcement agencies, and 
and it just it needs to um, we need to have judges that follow the law and do what they're supposed to do. And so I thank you. Well, judges usually have the last word, so that shouldn't surprise anybody, right? Okay. All right. State representative Eric Roberts. This is an A plus rating. Okay, two A. Send him back. Send him back to that state house. You want to come and say something real quick? First off, I'd like to thank the um, Higher Plains for opening up their their church tonight for this venue. Thank you, Pastor. And uh, I am Eric Roberts. I'm currently have the privilege of serving uh, D District 83. Welcome to District 83. This is in the district. And uh, hopefully, I do not have a primary opponent, but I do have a general opponent. So hopefully in November, you all will send me back. Thank you. Another A-rated conservative, Senator Jake Merrick. Sir, would you come right on up here and say a few words? Well... We aren't now serving one-year terms. It's just that I was elected in a special election, and it's already time again. So, um, State Senator Jake Merrick, District 22, running for re-election. Appreciate your vote. This is now in my district, Higher Plains is, so I'm excited about that, excited about connecting with you guys. So, anyway, I have a booth back there. I'd love to chat with you. I know this gets tiring, but another, another A-plus rated voting record, uh, State Senator Warren Hamilton. Sir, would you come up? He's got a message real quick to say. Thank you, Don. My name's Warren Hamilton. I'm from southeast Oklahoma. I've got the best kids in the, in the state, and I'm married to the second prettiest girl since uh, God created Eve. I love guns. I love America. I love Jesus. And in my spare time, I'm campaigning for Dr. Mark Sherwood for governor. God bless Oklahoma. Also, before I forget, I just, State Representative Kendricks, stand up. He doesn't have a, yeah, I see, I spotted you. That's right. And Mr. Bradley Carter, city councilman, if you, stop, you can stand up. That's right. There you go. A couple other elected officials. Both were endorsed by OK2A. Okay oh, yeah. State Representative Jay Stiegel, he's only got like an A++ or an A++ rating with him. Come on up here, sir. He's also uh, has an opponent for this fall. I think I would like to make sure this guy gets sent back also. Thanks. I represent uh, House District 43 out in Yukon. I do have a general election this fall. Love to come back and serve the great people of this state. I have the pleasure of having the most fun in the house I chair the State Powers Committee. Yeah. Some of my committee mates are here, Denise uh, and I work together very hard on that committee. Uh, anyway, I enjoy what I do. I love the people of this state and love to continue my service there. Let's go back and, and make this happen again. Thanks. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, Kevin Calvey Folks, when it comes to working and defending liberty, this guy is just beyond rock solid. He not only was excellent help while he was in the state legislature, even after he helped represent Oklahoma Second Amendment Association against a, a, a legal action to try to take away constitutional carry. So he's not just in, he's all in. And he's here tonight, sir, and reps, or reps, yes, old habits die hard. Uh, District... What is, oh, I almost called him District Commissioner Calvey, sir. Would you mind coming up here just for a minute? I'll get it right in a minute. <laughs> so, any gun lovers out there? Woohoo! <clears throat> so, how many of y'all have heard of the, of the stand your ground law? Okay, well, I wrote that law back when I was in the legislature. That's before OK2A was even around, and then certainly worked with OK2A extensively when I went back for a second helping in the legislature. Uh, been a defender of the Second Amendment uh, ever since, both as a lawyer and as a legislator. And now I'm seeking to be your district attorney in Oklahoma County because it's about time we had somebody in the DA's office in Oklahoma County who cared about your Second Amendment rights. And so I really need your help. We're going to stand up for the Second Amendment rights of all our citizens, and we're not going to be prosecuting police officers for just defending themselves against an armed robber like they are doing right now. So. I really need your help. Uh, you know, I've got the, you know, some opponents in the primary who know nothing about gun rights, and we're, we're going to you know, try to take them out and, and uh, 
you know, uh, uh, we, we need a change in that regime over there in the district attorney's office. So hope I can count on your vote. Please pray for me and my family, which I'm going to leave a little early because i got seven kids I'm going to get back to. Uh, and I don't have one of them asleep on my arm this time like I have in speeches past. But we're going to get back there. But please, uh, you know, spread the word for me and keep me in your prayers. God bless you. God bless America. Thank you. Okay, we're going to get on with the program here. I appreciate all the uh, people that are running for office to come up. Um, I, I just have to ask this question. I'm going to ask the guys. How many of you guys have gone home to your wife and said, man, I sure hope I get audited this year? Is that, or, or, or the, the wives come home and say, hey, we just went through the best audit ever. Any of the wives ever say that? No, and, and so what, what I'm getting at is the position of an auditor, no matter how good, polite, nice, that just the nature of it is just to be considered evil because it's just a threat. And so it, over the past few months especially, I've heard some statements about our state auditor that just did not seem consistent with the person that we had endorsed uh, four years ago. And so I wanted the opportunity to hear her side of what's going on and give us an, a, an evaluation of what's going on. And I want to make sure this is clear. Tonight, this is not about a debate. This is about information. And so also we will have questions for people to ask uh, when this is over. And again, it's questions and it's not a debate. And if you try to go into debate, you will be cut off and we'll move on. But I want to make sure everyone can be heard. But I can say it, it's, it's really, it, it's a tough situation for the auditor of a state to be in because whenever they so whenever say, well, we're getting audited, you know, just like the grumblings that take place, it, it's just natural. And so whoever that person is, is just naturally a target for, uh, to try to divert from what the real issue is. So I want to bring up at this time, state auditor Cindy Bird. Oh, one, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm going to bring up Paul Blair. I'm another Patriots Patriot. I, I kind of lovingly refer to these guys as the Militia Baptist Church over there in Enid, or no, in Edmond. There you go. My kind of guy. It's too bad he's only got one on, but okay. All right, sir, Paul Blair. Thank you, sir. Oh, you bet. Well, it is great, Tom. Thank you for opening up your church for such an important service to the community. By the way, I do covet your church. This is a fantastic facility, and we could use the space. Let's talk afterwards about a trade, perhaps. But uh, this is a significant day. Not only is this a significant day in our state's history, August the 9th, or April the 19th, but actually 247 years ago this very day, there was a report that came out of Boston when some 700 British regulars crossed the Charles River and other patriots rode through the countryside alarming the uh, colonists or the, that uh, there was trouble on the horizon. And of course, it was in the wee hours of April the 19th, 1775, in the churchyard of Lexington. Uh, there was a group of about 77 patriots from that community led by their pastor, Tom Vineyard, no, Jonas Clark, uh, <laughs> and the head of their militia, a retired captain from the French Indian Wars, Deacon John Parker, and the first shots of, of independence were fired there. The first blood spilt for the liberty that we now still enjoy and perhaps are hanging on to tenuously by a thread. So this is a significant day in many rights. Uh, I wanted to take a minute today just to introduce Cindy and, and express to you I had no dog in this fight. I had no bias one way or the other. Uh, I'm pretty much of a people person. I like our team. I recognize the bad guys, and I don't like for us to spend a lot of ammunition on each other when there are genuinely evil out there growing in our, in our state and in our country, uh, and quite frankly, globally. And uh, I was asked to a meeting down at the state uh, auditor and inspector's office maybe eight, ten months ago, and it were friends there. Uh, Megan Winburn, who I've known for years and worked with on campaigns, 
of course, Andrew Spino that we worked with in our Protect Life and Marriage effort, worked on my campaign. Holly Gerard, a patriot, one of my good friends, worked in one of my several failed campaigns. Thank God I will never run for office again. But anyway, uh, and then I recognize that Bob Lind, uh, is, who is a friend, I'm, I'm an Oak Pack supporter. I've spoken at Oak Pack. I've, uh, Charlie Meadows, a member of our congregation, was the founder of Oak Pack. Uh, it, it troubled me that people that I thought should be sitting together around the same table were now at odds with each other. And I wanted to figure out why and see if we could make some peace. And, and really, you know, we'd seen, I get the Oak Pack emails, and one of the things that really troubled me was when I saw uh, one of the many alleged allegations one week was that, was that Cindy Bird was using her alias, Cindy. And she's actually not licensed as Cindy, but Cynthia. Well, that's pretty stupid. You know, I've been married to Cynthia Marquis, now Cynthia Blair, for 33 years. I've never called her Cynthia until right now. She's always gone by Cindy. I've got a son that's a lawyer. His name is Joshua. On his, on his law license, it says Joshua, but we call him Josh. So I thought, well, that was a pretty baseless argument. If that's the kind of stuff you're throwing out there, you must not have a lot of real substance. And I had listened to Cindy's presentation, and it seemed to make sense. And I had reached out to Bob and members of Oak Pack that I still consider friends. I hope they don't consider me a hostile party now because I'm not. And I had suggested that we actually have a gathering. I suggested that we get seven believers, maybe a couple of attorneys, a couple of auditors that were all true Christ followers, not just Christians in name only, and perhaps a couple of pastors, and let both sides present their evidence for perhaps an hour, and then have both sides the opportunity to uh, question the other for maybe another 30 minutes. And then for the, the seven of this council to make a recommendation. Obviously, it wouldn't be legally binding, but it would be the, the church or the professing body of Christ trying to take care of some uh, believer business within our own body looking for justice. I don't have a dog. Again, I don't have a dog in this fight. I, I just want justice. I want Oklahoma to win. And uh, I was very disappointed when that idea was soundly rejected. You know, I believe everyone is innocent until proven guilty and sadly we have a lot of uh, guilt by media rather than guilt or innocence determined by evidence so I think that Cindy deserves this opportunity and if the facts lay out and it's one decision so be it if the facts are laid out and it's the other then we have to recognize that as well so I hope that you are here with an open heart and an open mind, and I hope that you are truly seeking truth, because that's what I want to find out. And as we have seen on the national scale, we're seeing right now with the Elon Musk attempt to provide free speech to Americans, uh, there's a significant group of people that just want one side's argument to be heard. Quite frankly, I'm a, as a believer, I welcome the debate. Let's get into a, a, an apologetics debate about facts if the tomb really wasn't empty, then we don't really need to waste any time pretending that it was. But if it was empty, then your whole eternity is determined by your decision as to what you do with that bit of information. So I welcome uh, inspection. We welcome debate, and we should welcome this opportunity tonight to hear the other side of the story because we haven't been given the opportunity to hear it, and she hasn't been given the privilege to express it. So I hope that you will join with me as a truth-loving, God-fearing Oklahoman, proud citizen of Oklahoma, and welcome our state auditor and inspector to the stage, Miss Cindy Byrd. Thank you to Don Spencer and OK2A for hosting this event and letting me speak tonight. And thank you also to Ralph Crawford with the Oklahoma County Republican Party and Margaret Best for their help in organizing this event and getting the word out. It is truly an honor to be your state auditor and to be with you here tonight. Um, I'm Oklahoma's 13th state auditor and I'm the first woman elected to this position. I've worked for the state auditor's office for over 25 years. It was my first job out of college. I thought I was going to be an attorney, but my grandmother could not stand the thought of that. 
And she knew me better than I knew myself and put me on the road to becoming an accountant. And I love numbers, so she was right. Um, my first assignment was to audit the county treasurer's office in Wilburton, Oklahoma. They gave me a stack of about 500 ad valorem tax receipts. That's your property tax receipts. And uh, it was my job to add these up and make sure every penny was deposited in the bank. And for three weeks, I literally watched government taking money from its citizenry. I had a front row seat to single moms, the elderly, ranchers, watching them make their property tax payments. And I knew right then that what's collected from the citizenry must be kept to a minimum, and every single penny had to be accounted for. And I became a very passionate auditor, watching over every dime that government spends. So tonight's presentation is not my normal MO. I'm here to set the record straight about the epic audit in great detail and speak frankly about how some groups and factions within our party have used this audit to discredit the state auditor's office and myself. And I'm also going to address three other audits at the end that I think you'll be very interested in. So I have several animated slides, so it's very important that you be able to see that. This is Ben Harris, founder of Epic Charter Schools. He graduated from UCO in 1997 with a degree in political science, and then went on to get a master's of business degree. His alumni, UCO, in 2011, actually paid Ben Harris $60,000 to get out of the contract to sponsor Epic Charter because the agreement was not valid and had not been approved through proper channels. Now, when is the last time you heard of a university volunteering to return money? Jerry Rieger served as the Oklahoma Secretary of Health and Human Services with Governor Frank Keating. Rieger resigned in 2002 to be a cabinet secretary for Governor Jeb Bush and oversee the Florida Department of Children and Families. Rieger hired Ben Harris, he was 28 years old, and he gave him the title Deputy Secretary of Operations and Technology. Harris brought David Cheney to Florida with him. Less than a year into the position, Harris and Cheney's actions triggered a full criminal investigation by Florida law enforcement because they accepted trips, dinners, and entertainment from lobbyists of companies that Harris circumvented the state's bidding process to award with agency contracts. A couple of those contracts were awarded to Elizabeth Van Acker, who is now Harris's wife. Harris resigned in 2004, but no charges were filed despite the investigation, concluding that Harris failed to make impartial decisions with the appearance of ethic impropriety. In the early 2000s, Harris and Cheney worked together at an education management company called Advanced Academics. Harris helped establish charter schools and find people to serve on those boards. And in return, the charter school hired Advanced Academics for a large percentage to help manage the school and use their technology resources. Harris established one virtual charter in Florida that contracted with Advanced Academics for 90% of the school's funding and any grant money to provide services to the school, and his wife served as a board member. Harris has mentioned it was from his charter school development around the country that he knew how to create EPIC. So what is an education management company? Charter schools contract with education management companies for services to help them establish all necessary financial, legal, IT, and even curriculum and program needs. And there are two different types of charter schools. There is a sector of charter schools established by a grassroots movement. People within a community see a need, they come together to establish a charter school, and the community establishes an independent governing school board composed of concerned citizens and parents. Now that is very different from the sector of charter schools intentionally established so that education management companies make big profits from our public education dollars. For-profit charter management companies have become the Enron of public education. And that's what we're talking about here with Harris and Cheney. What you're looking at, well, it's not spaghetti. This is a diagram from the investigative audit of Oxford Prep Academy, a charter school in California that Harris was the mastermind behind. Epic Youth Services LLC and E2 
are education management companies owned and operated by Harris, Cheney, and their CFO, Josh Brock. They created this complex scheme, which is the linking of nonprofits with for-profits companies to move money, and it looks very similar to what they did in Oklahoma. The Oxford PrEP audit findings were very similar to part one of our audit here in Oklahoma. Needless to say, Oxford PrEP was forced to shut down, and shortly after, the laws were changed in California. Charter schools are no longer hire, allowed to hire for-profit education management companies. Now, it's very important for you to know that the state auditor's office doesn't audit routinely school districts. We must be formally requested. When we show up, it's because something appears to have gone wrong, and we've been requested to investigate. This audit was not about or against charter schools, virtual education, or choice options for families. This audit was really not about the school. This audit needs to be renamed the investigative audit of an education management company that took over the school's checkbook. The investigation was about how Ben Harris and David Cheney created a complex scheme to siphon off millions of taxpayer dollars dedicated for student learning to become state-appropriated millionaires. And it is the worst abuse of taxpayer funds in the history of Oklahoma. In the summer of 2019, the OSBI issued two separate public reports accusing Harris and Cheney, the founders of EPIC, of fraud, embezzlement, forgery, and racketeering. Governor Stitt requested an audit, this audit, of EPIC charter schools and all related entities. And by law, I'm required to carry out the governor's request. At that same time, Oak Pack had Ben Harris as their speaker, who blamed the OSBI investigation on the education establishment. Bob Lynn called the investigation fake news, classic communist propaganda, and compared what Ben Harris was going through to the deep state against Donald Trump. And EPIC's spokeswoman, Shelley Hickman, called this an attack because the enrollment makes the status quo education lobbyist uncomfortable. So here's the concept. In 2005, Ben Harris and David Cheney started Epic Youth Services, LLC. It's a private, for-profit education management company. Now, Harris and Cheney had built their company, and now they needed a way to finance their company. So in 2011, Harris and Cheney founded Epic Charter Schools. Now, Epic is a public school, just like Oklahoma City Public Schools. Absolutely no part of this school is private, and EPIC is 100% taxpayer funded. Even though Harrison Cheney started the school, they do not own EPIC charter schools. Harrison Cheney own EPIC Youth Services, LLC, which is a private education management company, which is separate from the school. But it's confusing on purpose to have both their company and the school called EPIC. Harrison Cheney created a nonprofit 501c3 to govern the school, and they named it Community Strategies. Now, all charter schools are set up to have a nonprofit board in order to receive the state appropriations for the school. Now, charter school governing board members are not elected like traditional public schools. They are appointed. So Harrison Cheney filled the five seats on the governing school board with hand-picked, admitted, longtime friends. The friendship was not the problem. It was about choosing individuals who would not question their decision making. And the handpicked governing school board is in gray because they only served as figureheads. They only met four times a year and voted on financial matters that had already happened. It was Harrison Cheney as the private company that ran the school board meetings. Harrison Cheney wrote an operating agreement, I'm going to call this the contract for their friends on the school board to hire their company to manage the school. Now, Harrison Cheney's private company was hired for 10% of all dollars both state and federal received by Epic Charter Schools. The problem was their contract never specified exactly what services and or goods Harrison Cheney's company was going to provide to the school for their 10% management fee. And there's more. And this is the most controversial part. 
Harris and Cheney also wrote into the contract that their company was to manage a student learning fund account. So Harris and Cheney set up the learning fund account to collect $1,000 per student per year from the school's general fund and deposited those dollars into an outside bank account. Then Harris and Cheney tasked themselves to manage each student's $1,000 on behalf of the school. So Harris and Cheney created a structure where their private company receives 30% of all the school's public dollars and complete control of the school. Now behind the solid line, Harris and Cheney have two private accounts, one for their 10% management fee and the other for the student learning funds. Now by terming these funds as their private funds, it was locked down from any type of government oversight. And no one, including the state auditor, has ever been able to verify that the dollars placed into those accounts are being used for what they were intended for by law and by contract. When Harrison and Cheney had their friends on the school board agree to the contract, it literally placed all educational and all financial decisions of the school into the hands of these two company owners. In order to keep everything behind the solid line hidden, Harrison and Cheney did the following. Harrison and Cheney contracted with one CFO named Josh Brock, who answers to them as the founders of the school and also answers to them as the owners of the company. So how can the CFO of the school also be the CFO of the company? On one hand, the CFO writes the check from the school funds, and then on the other hand, signs the back of the check as he deposits it on behalf of the private company. Now a little side note, Josh Brock, the CFO, is from Cushing, and coincidentally, Epic's hired auditor, as well as their largest technology vendor contract, were all from Cushing. So we found it ironic that the hired auditor's name was Mr. Crooks, Now from 2011 to 2019, for eight years, David Cheney, 50% owner of the company, also served as superintendent of the school. And it makes you wonder, as superintendent, was Cheney looking out for the best interest of the school, for the best interest of his company? And why would the school board's attorney, Bill Hickman, ever allow a contract like this to be signed? Isn't it the role of the school board's attorney to advise and protect the school board? Well, let's just say he made a generous salary and it seemed as if the needs of the company came first. Epic's spokeswoman was Shelley Hickman, the school board's attorney's wife. After the audit was released, the company hired an internal auditor and she was used by the company to present reports to the school board assuring them that there was no malfeasance with the 10% management fee or the student learning fund account. The internal auditor's reports were then used by Epic's PR and hired lobbyist to persuade decision makers that the audit was flawed. We've since learned that the Epic's internal auditor was a family member of Josh Brock, the CFO. So as you can see from the Harris and Cheney pictures, there's no distinction between Epic Public Schools, the governing school board, and the private management company. It's all Harris and Cheney. And it appears that Harris Cheney and CFO Josh Brock handled all the financial transactions and were probably the only three who really knew what was going on behind the scenes. Now between 2015 and 2021, $68 million was paid to the company for their 10% and an additional $145 million dedicated for student learning was transferred to the company's private account without any transparency or accountability. So who works for Harrison Cheney to take care of all the management and administration of the school, which was the largest school district in the state at that time? Well, we met with Harris and we asked for his employee count. And he responded with, what the legislature will do if we make our employee count public record, they will bludgeon us about our fees. They will say it's too much money and I need a price decrease. Well, Harris never told us his employee count. But according to his reports filed with the Oklahoma Employment Security Commission, the company had zero employees outside the two owners from 2010 to 2018. So who was doing the work of the company? Who was managing Epic one-on-one, -on -one, the all-virtual school? Who was managing Epic's other entities? For example, who was managing the Epic Blended Schools, the Epic California School, 
or Panola, Epic's conversion school? And most importantly, who was managing the student learning fund? The answer, Epic school employees. Epic school employees that were paid with state tax dollars, working on state computers and state funded buildings, utilizing state email addresses, did the work of the private company. Now, if a for-profit company is utilizing state paid employees and state paid resources to run and benefit their private business, this is considered embezzlement. From 2011 to 2019, Harris and Cheney never submitted a detailed invoice to the school board for payment for their $68 million. That places the governing school board and the company in possible violation of the Internal Revenue Service laws, the IRS. So Harris and Ch Cheney's company are required to prove to the board what services and the cost of those services that they are providing to the school, which is a nonprofit, for their 10% fee. And the board is required to prove that they are not paying above fair market value for those services. Now, it wasn't until 2019 that the company was forced by law to provide a detailed invoice to support their 10% management fee to the State Department of Education and the school board. And it's also important to note that by law, the company's invoice for services must be actual income and expenditures with no estimates or prorated amounts. So let's take a look at the company's invoice. The company submitted these falsified invoices for payments. They created these 14 categories and submitted the same exact percentages every month for the entire year. Epic One-on-One, -on -one, this is a purely online school, and then Epic Blended, these are brick and mortar locations where students can attend. See the food service management? How does a virtual only school have $37,000 spent for students that require no child nutrition cost? Remember how I told you the company had, um, had no employees until 2018 before they hired a security guard and a lobbyist? See the certified salaries and non-certified salaries? How can the company claim certified salaries when they had no teachers working for them? And claim non-certified salaries when the company has no staff? We also have several questions why a purely online school needs to spend over $600,000 for land rental and construction services. And as you can see, Harrison Cheney took a 10% cut of every school dollar based on false pretenses. And remember, David Cheney was both superintendent, signing off on the purchase orders, and 50% owner of the company. So he was on both sides of every transaction and attested by signed affidavit that the falsified financial information submitted to the State Department of Education was accurate. Now, I reread the hired company's contract over 20, 20 times, at least, and I kept asking myself, what services have we been paying this company for, for their 10% fee? And for asking these types of questions, I've been accused of being against free market enterprise, and I've been questioned numerous times in different ways if I'm too concerned about the company's profit margin. Now, from 2015 to 2021, the company was paid $68 million. We know they provided IT services, so Epic is currently paying, right now, approximately $1.5 million for IT services. So let's use this number. $1.5 million over the time frame of the audit, 2015 to 2021, is $10.5 million. And the company provided a superintendent, okay, the highest paid superintendent in Oklahoma makes around $400,000. So $400,000 paid for a superintendent services from 2015 to 2021 is $2.8 million. And finally, we know the company provided a CFO. So the highest paid CFO in a school in Oklahoma is, makes around $200,000. So $200,000 paid for CFO services from 2015 to 2021 is $1.4 million. So we can make an accounting for $14.7 million paid for services the company provided from 2015 to 2021. That's what you would pay for fair market value of those services. Now the $14.7 million compared to $68 million means that there is $53.3 million unaccounted for. And $53.3 million is the major reason why there has been little change and much strife and cover-up surrounding this investigation. 
For $68 million, this company has placed the school in both legal and financial trouble. They falsified their reports under affidavit, and they violated the school's charter on 13 accounts. Bob Lynn said to me, I don't care if Ben Harris takes all the money. It doesn't matter how much he makes. I don't care if his teachers are slaves and don't get paid anything and live in his basement. I really don't care because Oklahoma is still getting a great product for half the price of government school. Now let's turn our attention to the Student Learning Fund. I am unaware of any other state in this nation that would allow taxpayer dollars appropriated for student learning to be controlled by a private company in a private account without any kind of transparency or accountability. The State Auditor's Office and the Attorney General's Office believes the Student Learning Fund is public money. In the spring of 2019, amid the investigation by state and federal law enforcement, Harrison Cheney released a video to explain the Student Learning Fund. The video clearly states that these are public funds for each student to be used for each student's curriculum and activity needs, and the video ends by assuring the viewers that there is nothing secretive about the Student Learning Fund and that this account is audited each year. Well, it seems clear that the Student Learning Fund is not Harris and Cheney's earned income or a fee for service. So when Bill Hickman, the school's attorney, said that millions of taxpayer dollars in the Student Learning Fund is private and shielded from the public's knowledge, it took some by surprise. Even Senator Gary Stanislawski, the primary author of the virtual charter school policy in Oklahoma, did not know that Epic was sending public dollars for the learning fund to its private management company. Stanislawski adamantly said that the student learning fund is a direct expenditure for the benefit of the child and the public should be able to see how the money is spent. And Harris and Cheney set up a ring of legal counsel around their private accounts and the governing school board. Powerful law firms continue to stonewall us from obtaining basic public information. And unprecedented in the history of the state auditor's office, an audit team has never been met with such intimidation tactics. We were forced to use subpoenas, and over 50 subpoenas have been issued to date. In March of 2020, with the help and advice of my legal counsel with the Attorney General's office, the State Auditor's Office filed with Oklahoma County District Court a motion to compel the company to comply with our subpoena request for the Student Learning Fund records. The State Chamber filed an amicus brief against SANI's request for the Student Learning Fund. The court filing did not mention that David Cheney was on the State Board of Directors. This is the company's brief filed in court regarding the nature of the Learning Fund. The company claims that the learning funds are their private funds and are not subject to disclosure. The company also mentions using the FQSR, the first quarter statistical report, as the method they use to calculate how much money is transferred from the school's general fund to the student learning fund. And this is very important to note because on the private company's invoices to the school, for how much to withdraw from the school's general fund and deposit into this outside bank account for the learning fund, the student count was left blank. And there was nothing to indicate how many students times 1,000 equals the dollar amount paid to the student learning fund. Now, according to the company's brief they filed in court, they claim they used the State Department of Education student count criteria, that FQSR. Well, if this is the number that they're going to use, then that would mean that during the time frame of our audit, the company overpaid themselves $8.3 million. The CFO, on the other hand, claims that he used the day 45 enrollment count. Okay, so if that's the number we're gonna use, then the company overpaid themselves $7.4 million. Then the company hired a forensic accountant with Grant Thornton. And based on his calculations of the student count, he determined that the company, during the time frame of our audit, underpaid themselves. 1.6 million. Well, we couldn't understand how he arrived at his number, so we had a phone meeting. And after further questioning, the auditor explained that he had used every single student who enrolled prior to October to calculate the student count. Well, we found that very interesting, and so we asked, 
Are you including students who may have enrolled in EPIC but never participated in a day of instruction? And after a pause, he answered yes. Now, we received threats from EPIC's attorneys if we spoke out about the $8.3 million overpayment from the school into the learning fund. The school's attorney said, since the learning funds are private funds, the state auditor's conclusion of overpayments was speculative at best. But our overpayment findings were validated on June 24th of 2021, when the state virtual charter school board compliance auditor reported that the learning fund payments didn't match enrollment at Epic One-on-One. -on -one. The compliance auditor said that Harris and Cheney's company received at least four million in extra funds from the virtual only school in just one year. Now let's look at another example of the company mishandling the learning fund dollars. So here's the question. If things like curriculum and technology are coming out of the school funds and things like curriculum and technology are coming out of the learning funds, why are there separate accounts, one public and one private? Why is a private learning fund even necessary? Shouldn't all public school expenditures come from the school's general fund? Now, Harrison Cheney refused to prove how they spend the $1,000 per student per year because he says releasing that information publicly will compromise their entire business model. Instead, the company gave us these price ranges, not actual expenses, so what are the real cost? The company allegedly placed $1,000 into student accounts that was held by the company. The money was never given directly to the parents or students. And then the company immediately skimmed off the top allocated fines and fees, like the $85 software and shipping fee. $85, the $85 fee taken off the top for each of the 60,000 EPIC students enrolled for the 2020 school year, that's nearly $5.2 million. What was the $5 million used for? Nobody knows. We're also concerned Harris and Cheney were personally profiting, along with friends and family, by being a vendor and or possibly marking up the cost of items sold to the children. We do know that they used the Student Learning Fund as a line of credit to provide cash flow to their business, which is clearly seen by the several million in transfers to their private bank account. Instead of using their 10% management fee to pay for their business expenses, in, in the expansion of their company, Harris and Cheney used money from the Student Learning Fund as their personal piggy bank. And this appears to be why they deliberately overpaid the Student Learning Fund over $14 million from 2015 to 2021. We found thousands of dollars of Oklahoma Student Learning Fund money designated for Oklahoma students was transferred to finance their Epic California startup, as well as cover its payroll expenses. And finally, Brock and Cheney used their personal credit cards to make expenditures for the Student Learning Fund, as well as their own personal spending. So thousands of your tax dollars have now paid for legal services to distinguish what credit card transactions were for the school and what credit card transactions were for personal expenses. Now you can see why Harris and Cheney continue to claim that these are their private funds. $145 million. When these things were pointed out during our exit interviews to CFO Brock and the school's attorney, Bill Hickman, here's how the company responded. This is the learning fund contract language during our audit. And this is the learning fund contract language one month after the audit was released. The company literally doubled down against everything the audit warned against. And they have used this new language as their way to navigate out of anything that appeared to be criminal. Harris and Cheney clarif clarified that the learning fund was their private money, that they never have to turn over the records, and they can take funds for students who did not attend a day of instruction. And they took out the language that prohibited them from marking up the cost of items their company sold to the children. And the governing school board, their hand-picked board, signed off on this new contract. On May 6th of 2021, the multi-county grand jury issued a 25-page interim report. This was not a final report. The report's purpose was not to issue indictments. The report served two important purposes. First, it was a warning to the legislature before the close of session to not release more public funds to this company. 
Unfortunately, this warning was ignored and the company walked away with an additional $80 million just last year. Secondly, the report urged Epic's board members to fire Harris and Cheney's company and recognize its fiduciary duty to the taxpayers and extricate itself from its incestuous relationship with a private company profiting on the backs of students. This report did not exonerate the company from criminal charges. On September 7th, the multi-county grand jury's time expired before the case was finished. The multi-county grand jury interim report did help because on May 6, 2021, a new EPIC school board was sworn in and their first order of business was to terminate the multi-million dollar management contract with Harris and Cheney's company, EPIC Youth Services. The announcement filled both the national and local news. The newly elected board chair, Paul Campbell, clearly stated that EPIC charter schools severed ties with Harris and Cheney and from their California school. EPIC's new CFO informed the school's board that by no longer paying a management fee, the 10%, the school will see a 13% increase in per student funding. And this new path results in Epic saving $30 million in one year to put back into the students and families. In 2021, the school was going to pay $30 million to Harris and Cheney. The school already had a superintendent. The $30 million was going to go to two people who were providing the school mediocre technology. It was nothing proprietary or special. In 2022, the school will keep $29 million for the students and apply $1 million for a technology upgrade. During the settlement agreements, Harris and Cheney pressured the board to purchase their software program for $78 million. The new school board had the sense to replace the company's technology system for $1 million. Epic Charter Schools is a success story of what can happen when a government entity receiving taxpayer dollars gets back into compliance. Because of the work across multiple agencies, Epic was not shut down, like many other schools across the nation have been when money was found misappropriated. Epic Charter Schools today is transparent, accountable, and stronger, and truly centered around developing the students for their future. EPIC's concurrent classes are up 72%, so there will be a 385% of the students on track for graduating with both a high school degree and an associate's degree. However, the company continues to be a problem for the school. On October 4th, EPIC's board chairman, Paul Campbell, told lawmakers that they had been gaslighted for years by the founders, and that if they are still big fans, they must reassess the situation, because as he called them, Bad actors, con men, and prolific liars who exerted total control over the school and operated the finances in silos to take advantage of a lot of really good people, including the school's leadership. Campbell went on to say that for the school to move forward, it's time to stop with them. But that didn't stop Harris and Cheney. They filed a breach of contract suit in court for the school to pay them $6.8 million for transitional services and another $430,000 for providing personnel. Now, Harris and Cheney have not turned over the student learning fund records to the school, claiming they are still paying vendor invoices. However, learning fund vendors keep calling the school inquiring why they have not been paid, and this has placed close to another $10 million burden on the school. The school has had to expend money for attorney's fees to fight the company's continued shenanigans. On February 1st, I was asked to give an epic update to the House education members. It had been two years since the last time. And I shared about how Ben Harris and David Cheney's scheme has been protected because of large campaign contributions, millions spent on advertising, PR, and lobbying efforts, and philanthropic giving, all paid for by your tax dollars. And then three days later, on February 4th, A.G. O'Connor handed the case over to D.A. Prater. Several levels of law enforcement, including the IRS, are engaged and they're aggressively looking into this. And I know there will be felony charges because the criminality of this cannot be ignored. Normally, if the state auditor notifies the public and the legislators there has been abuse of millions of taxpayer dollars, there's immediate action. But after the release of the EPIC audit on October 1st, 2020, 
no action was taken. Instead, personal attacks against myself and SAI began circulating. From the fall of 2020 and the summer of 2021, I been, began to discover just how much power and political control Harris and Cheney had wielded over the years in order to cover up their actions and smear anyone who questioned them. It wasn't even an hour after part one of the investigative audit was released in October of 2020 that EPIC's PR team had a full campaign in force to discredit the audit findings. The picture was painted. I was the evil politician whose audit was fact-checked and determined pure propaganda. The next day, Shelley Hickman was on Scott Mitchell's show stating that the audit was a clear political agenda to get EPIC. And EPIC had issued a 134-page response to our audit just a mere 72 hours after its release. Bob Lynn was one of the first to post EPIC's rebuttal to the audit. He called the audit a diatribe against free enterprise. Literally seven days after the audit is published, OPAC invited Brian Hobbs, Ben Harris's cousin, to speak about the audit. And I couldn't understand at the time why OPAC, who had endorsed and supported my election unanimously in 2018, did not ask me to come and address any questions or concerns they had related to the audit findings. It has been baffling to me that the individuals and groups like OPAC that once praised my audits that exposed over 10 million in fraud at the local level are now the same people when I issue an audit that revealed the largest amount of unaccounted for taxpayer funds in the history of this state, they want to demonize me. Since the release of the EPIC audit, Bob Lynn, through his OPAC newsletter at OPAC meetings and when he speaks to other GOP groups, has called me a liar, a socialist, and a Marxist. He said, I'm offended we supported Cindy Byrd. She has committed malice. She has accosted and harassed two people for having too much success. And just to reiterate, EPIC is a government school that teaches the same curriculum as every other public school. It's funny though, Lynn praised Governor Stitt around the time that he requested the audit. Now part of the continued smear campaign came from the Sooner Politics website a central place for art articles to be posted by Al Gearhart, Sooner Tea Party, the 1889 Institute, and OCPA, our conservative think tank, Steve Anderson, and several others. Sooner Politics became a weekly echo chamber by these groups to discredit the auditor's office and the investigation of EPIC. Their articles were also sent out to their individual memberships and posted on social media, for example, at the first presentation of the audit, just 24 hours after the audit's release, Sooner Politics writes that I exhibited a bureaucratic mindset and that the audit was a waste of state resource. Even after Harris and Cheney were terminated from the school, Sooner Politics posted a love note to the founders. Less than 24 hours after our 116-page audit on EPIC was filed, OCPA published an article entitled Children deserve an audit process beyond reproach. Two days later, OCP OCPA published irregularities found in the state audit of EPIC. One day after that, did the audit recommend illegal action? That article contained information we never reported in our audit. It was information we only alerted EPIC to resolve in a private meeting. And then to complete the week, on October 7th, OCPA published why did the audit ignore state law and exclude responses? Seven days after the release of the audit, OCPA published four articles to discredit the findings. How is that possible? Using all the same talking points for weeks following, the other groups I mentioned joined in, except the rhetoric and headlines escalated. From 1889 Institute, Cindy Bird abuses office. She demonstrates ignorance of charter schools. Jonathan Small wrote for the journal record that the flawed audit is the problem, not EPIC. He even said that we recommended Biden policy regarding charter schools. Because the audit had a paragraph about California banning for-profit education management companies that take over charter schools. And when Ben Harris could not keep his speaking spot at OPAC, Jonathan spoke on his behalf about EPIC. 
Al Gearhart hosted a series of articles entitled Hatchet Job of an Audit, Name Calling, Disgusting Name Calling was littered throughout the article, just to name a few. He called me an idiot, incompetent, liar, and hypocrite, and things I would never say in church. In a couple of Gearhart's articles, he compares the Epic Audit to the Audit of the Health Department in 2017 concerning the claim that $30 million was missing. And it wasn't long after that that Bob Lynn and Steve Anderson with OPAC were in my office requesting information about the 20, 2018 Health Department audit. And I will explain how this relates in great detail. Last month, OPAC presented how I had been involved, along with some others, to cover up fraud and use the 2018 Health Department audit as their example. As your state auditor, I took an oath to uphold the Constitution and safeguard our taxpayer dollars. For Oak Pack to accuse me and the Office of State Auditor of deliberately covering up fraud, it's a very serious accusation. I've been told that somehow, since we were working with former AG Hunter, who was having a relationship with someone at the Health Department, that our investigation was tainted and we were part of the cover-up. Well, first, we learned about the affair with the rest of the public around the time that AG Hunter's resignation from office in May of 2021 happened. And secondly, no one can steer the results of the audit. Once A.G. Hunter made the request, he does not have the authority in any way to tamper with our audit findings. I will use former State Senator Ron Sharp as an example. I don't know anything about his tenure as senator. All I know is that as a member of the Senate Education Committee, he called for an investigation into EPIC. And Ben Harris and David Cheney sued him for slander and libel, turned other senators against him through letters and lobbying efforts, destroyed his reputation with dark money pack mailers and ads, and funded his opponent that cost him his seat. And all this was done with taxpayer money. Sharp did win the $500,000 libel lawsuit. Now, as an elected official, I'm not above criticism or concern, but as of right now, the lies and slander being presented has escalated to the point of grave concern. Where do we draw the line? At the Oak Pack meetings, Bob Lynn's subject matter expert said that the state auditor's office didn't know how to conduct federal audits and that our statewide audits hide problems and that he should contact the SEC to slap us around. Then Bob Lynn stood up and made an announcement that all Oak Pack candidates need to support Senate Bill 895. Well, in 2021, Senate Bill 895 was filed. This bill would allow state agencies to outsource their audits rather than use the state auditor's office. Now, I was never consulted about this legislation, a bill that would significantly change your state auditor's office, and that was on purpose. On March 11th, a Tulsa World article was released that tied Ben Harris to Senate Bill 895. The article mentions that on October 1st, the state auditor's office released Epic, the audit of EPIC, and on October 2nd, both Ben Harris and his wife gave the maximum contributions of $2,800 each to the author of the bill. Despite the several efforts made, none of these groups have been willing to meet with me to address their questions and concerns about the EPIC audit. Instead, they continue to work off of talking points provided by Harris and Cheney to present false conclusions to their audiences. There is only one explanation for this type of behavior, and that's protecting their private interest. Bottom line, I do believe these articles have been a coordinated effort and unfortunately, it goes much deeper and higher up than the groups mentioned this evening. The Epic Audit has become so much more than millions misappropriated for personal use by two guys running a charter school. It has revealed political corruption in this state. Over the past year, Epic schools have been making great accountability and transparency changes in order to get out of the legal and financial trouble Harris and Cheney put them in and to get back into compliance. So my question is, where are the articles? Where are the articles by these conservative groups about how since Epic has the courage to fire Harris and Cheney's company that was taking advantage of them, and they have 30 million more dollars to put back into the classroom in just one year, where is that article? Where are the articles that Epic has returned $20 million to the state treasury that's now being put back into all of education? 
When's the last time you heard of the state of Oklahoma being repaid $20 million for anything? Aren't these the things that we as conservatives should be celebrating? And next, I want to set the record straight on the top five lies perpetrated by Oak Pack, Bob Lynn, and Steve Anderson. Every week since January of 2021, Bob Lynn and Steve Anderson published my face with a new smear line and plug to have people come out and hear about their latest conspiracy against the state auditor. For several weeks, they had stories concerning my credentials. Steve Anderson and Bob Lynn explained how they tried to find my credentials on the Oklahoma County Board, and there was just no Cindy Bird found. Then dramatically, they showed a picture from the Oklahoma Accountancy Board revealing that I am registered as Cynthia Bird, as Pastor Blair explained earlier. Now, according to Lynn and Anderson, the attorneys they were working with indicated that they would never have thought to look for that alias. <laughs> and Anderson continues, the reason why she doesn't want you to know her real name is Cynthia Bird is because she doesn't want people to know that she does not have the credentials to perform the task we elected her for. The reason there is a no listed under the government audit column on the accountancy board is because as state auditor, I cannot be hired by the private sector for a payment to perform government audits. It has nothing to do with my qualifications. It's about availability for hire. And ironically, Steve Anderson is also not found anywhere on the accountancy board registry, but I did find Steven Anderson. Now, I've been a licensed CPA since 2003. And I, as I mentioned, the auditor's office was my first job out of college. I've been a government auditor for 25 years, which makes me the most qualified state auditor in over 30 years because I have actually performed every type of audit in the state auditor's office. I know the government auditing standards. I've done this at every level of government. So why did they do this? Oak Pack needed to make the case that I'm an unqualified government auditor to look incompetent as they try to blame the state auditor's office for the problems at the Oklahoma Health Department. Now, in 2017, there was a $30 million emergency bailout issued by a special session of the legislature to the health department because Mike Romero, the CFO at the time, declared that the health department was $30 million short and would not be able to make payroll. Also during this time, 198 health department employees were terminated throughout the state. The state auditor's office was called in by the AG to investigate the problem. Now, I was overseeing the county audit division at the time. I officed out of Ada, down in southeastern Oklahoma, and had nothing to do with this investigation. The state auditor's office determined that there was never a $30 million shortfall, and there was no money missing. The money was in a slush fund disguised as a federal account. All levels of law enforcement concluded with the state auditor's office that the health department was never in a financial crisis, and the 198 layoffs were unnecessary. The state of Oklahoma had to then pay millions on the lawsuits filed by all the employees who were wrongfully terminated. There were no indictments issued because moving money to a different account and forgetting where you put it is not by law a criminal offense. So why is Oak Pack resurrecting this issue again? Oak Pack claims that the state auditor's audits of the federal programs from 2011 to 2017 should have caught the problems at the health department before people lost their jobs and the legislature called a special session and supplemented them with $30 million. So they requested these work papers. And on January 22, 2021, Bob Lynn signed that he received the work papers for the 2017 year. And on April 15, 2021, the work papers from the 2015, 2016, and 2018 audits were obtained on his behalf and signed for by Ben Harris's cousin, Brian Hobbs. Now, the state auditor's office spent over three weeks compiling 14,000 pages of information for Mr. Lynn. He has everything he requested that the state auditor's office can legally provide. Work papers from the 2011 to 2014 audits no longer exist in accordance with records retention statutes and with auditing standards. And Oak Pack still claims that I've not complied with their open records request. To date, Mr. Lynn has refused to let me know what information is missing from his open records request. 
It was also interesting to see Bob Lynn's email domain to request the records between OPAC using a corporation's funding education domain. It was suggested to Mr. Lynn that he might want to obtain the work papers from the investigative audit of the health department because there's, there is ample evidence along with independent reviews from state and federal bureaus of investigation that are directly contrary to the accusations being made to OPAC members each week. He declined. Steve Anderson, Steve Anderson said this suggestion was SANI tampering with his investigation. OPAC has done everything they can to question the validity of the state auditor's office and myself so they can unseat me. OPAC has stated that I'm really a lifelong Democrat and that my job performance more closely mirrors that of the person who hired me, former state auditor and convicted criminal Jeff McMahon, who was a Democrat. Well, first, for the record, I was hired by Clifton Scott, had zero interaction with him. I was a first-level auditor working out of the ADA office. And here is another accusing me of teaming up with Superintendent Hoffmeister to attack charter schools and that I should admit that I am a Democrat. I'm a fourth generation Oklahoma. I grew up in Colgate, Oklahoma, a town of less than 2,000 in southeastern Oklahoma, and I still live there today with my husband, Steve Bird, and my family, my whole family. This is Oklahoma's Little Dixie, where Democrats account for a majority of the voters. This is my home, Cole County, and it's officially Oklahoma's bluest county. But would you believe that Little Dixie, including Cole County, is the most conservative area of the state? According to this article, Little Dixie is more socially conservative than even suburban Republicans. They call us legacy Democrats. We appear blue on paper, but always vote Republican. We love this state, and we love this country, and the principles it was founded upon. We are proud Second Amendment, pro-life and pro-freedom citizens of this state. Remember, our beloved Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump were both Democrats at one time. When I turned 18, the election board secretary told me, now honey, if you want to vote down here, you better register Democrat. I've always been a Republican, my, Republican in my votes for statewide and national offices, and I made it official in 2014 when we had our first Republican running for state senator and I cast my vote for Josh Burkeen. About, th <laughs> about three years later, Gary Jones, my predecessor, who was an excellent state auditor, asked me to consider running for state auditor, and I molded over for a year, and then in 2018, I decided to run. Gary and I still need to have a conversation about that. <laughs> but I did not switch to Republican to run for office. And per the scripture of Matthew 18, I asked Pastor Paul Blair to help arbitrate the disputes Oak Pack has had against myself and the state auditor's office. And Pastor Blair generously offered to assemble a panel of Christians, all with relevant professional backgrounds to help bring a resolution to the conflict. And I agreed to this proposal. Mr. Lynn refused. GOP Chairman John Bennett also made a similar, similar offer. I agreed, and Mr. Lynn refused. It seems that Mr. Lynn is intentionally manufacturing situations to galvanize opposition against me because of the ethic audit. I wrote this letter on October 11th, 2021 to distribute to board members to try to find reason. Last week, I received a letter from Bob Lynn requesting that I provide him all my communications with my communications person, including emails, text messages, and social media exchanges because of his behavior at the Oak Pack meetings, a list of all the inaccurate information that's been presented to Oak Pack concerning myself or the state auditor's office with factual proof corrections, explanations as to why I lack certification to audit, proof that I ensure all government auditing standards are applied for the statewide audit, explanation why I chose to delay his open records request with proof of the employee's timesheet for his open records redactions, and prove that I reviewed the health department audit to see if the information of Mike Hunter's affair impacted the results. If I do all of those things, then a chance to speak at OPAC will be considered. And if I can't, then it refutes my claim of being transparent. I might not be able to speak to OPAC, but I can ask that false accusations, slanderous libel, false information, and name-calling being presented to the membership of, of, membership of OPAC 
and other conservatives, as a fact, stop. Oak Pack recruited heavily to find a replacement for me. And it's too bad because I fit their advertisement perfectly. I am the only CPA running in this race. I am backed by the uh, association and there weren't any other CPAs who wanted to come out and run against me. And it's probably because they've looked at my work and deem it sufficient, if not excellent. Now on April 15th, Brian Hobbs, Ben Harris's cousin, escorted a candidate to run against me also into the Capitol and also escorting this candidate was Darren Gantz. I am walking into the next election cycle with a $500,000 bounty on my head with the promise of millions more for a smear campaign funded by Ben Harris with your tax dollars because I did my job and I released the audit of Epic Charter Schools. I was sent a Facebook post this weekend that the candidate had decided to run sometime around February 12th. Well, the timing of that is interesting. On February 1st, I gave a legislative update on EPIC, which was in, in great detail explained the status of it. And that's also the week that A.G. O'Connor handed this off to D.A. Prater. And then on February 9th, I released the Health Department audit. And I'm going to close by updating you on three major audits. So let's talk about the Health Department audit. And I'm so glad A.G. O'Connor could be with us tonight. So maybe you heard about on the news about the release of the Health Department audit conducted by the Performance Audit Division. And I wanted to take a moment to clear up any sensationalism by the media. In April 2020, former AG Mike Hunter requested that we conduct an investigative audit of the State Health Department. He had concerns with the way the Health Department was acquiring personal protective equipment, the PPE purchases. He also requested that we look into some of the contracting procedures. The State Auditor's Office completed the audit and delivered the report to the AG's office just days before AG Hunter abruptly resigned in May of 2021. Fast forward to now, I received an open records request for the audit by a reporter. As the head of an agency, I'm required to comply with the Open Records Act. I believe all public records should be open and easily accessible to the taxpayers. And all information used in this particular report is 100% public record and it could have been requested by a taxpayer if they would have known what to ask for. So I informed the governor the Tuesday before I released it. I also informed A.G. O'Connor the day that I released it by email. And as far as the findings, well, it was an unprecedented time in the midst of a pandemic. Trying to get necessary supplies, I do believe the health department did the very best they could to get the supplies that they felt was needed to protect us here in Oklahoma. We reported that $5.4 million was paid for PPE and the goods were never received. There were some issues about unauthorized purchasing power, which may have led, down, led to the breakdown in processes. We were also requested to investigate uh, about oh, the health department salaries and were they reasonable based on position. The next audit is one that we've just been asked to do this week, and that's an audit on the Department of Tourism. So on March 7th, we released an operational audit of the Oklahoma Department of Tourism, and we found that there were not enough controls in place to ensure that taxpayer money received at state parks was being uh, collected and deposited the way it should have been. We audited tourism's revenues, and meanwhile, LOFT, the Legislative Office of Fiscal Transparency, reviewed the department's expenditures. And we both came to the same conclusion. There are some serious concerns about how the Department of Tourism is spending taxpayer money and whether they're following the required bidding laws. As things have come to light, there are some concerning contracts. Outside of the, uh, what was reported in the news about the 17 million paid to Swadley's to renovate and operate state subsidized restaurants inside of Oklahoma State Parks, we're also looking at the management fees that were charged on top of that. And I've looked at some of the documentation and it's a very concerning situation. The OSBI is looking into this and DA Prater has requested an investigative audit into these contracts, which we will begin very soon. The executive, department, or executive director of the Department of Tourism um, also had a double bacon cheeseburger named after him called the Winchester. And I read on Twitter this week where, this weekend where it looks like it's a pretty tasty burger, but it does seem like some of these management fees that were allowed to be charged 
are concerning. The other thing that's concerning is that they took a large amount of taxpayer dollars, put them into the contract with Swatley's to allow them to do things that probably should have been contracted with directly. But this is an ongoing audit. Those are the things that have been reported in the news, and the State Auditor's Office can't talk about anything other than those parts until we issue the report. This is another example of when there's a problem, the state calls on your state auditor and inspector to figure out the problem. Lastly, a special investigative audit of the State Department of Education is the most requested audit by the taxpayer. And one of this type has never been conducted in the history of Oklahoma, and we can't find where anything like this has been done in the nation because it has to be formally requested. And Governor Stitt finally did that last year on September 16th. He did it at the request of 22 legislators who wrote a letter to him asking him to call for an investigation of the State Department of Education after the audit of EPIC revealed some issues. The audit's going to address two major questions that taxpayers have. How is my dollar, my tax dollar, reaching the student in the classroom? And do schools spend too much money on administrative costs? The audit has two primary objectives. The first, identify all revenue sources flowing into education. This is going to look at all federal, state, and local sources, and we're going to be looking at around $8 billion. And we're going to determine whether the revenues and expenditures were handled in accordance with the law. The second objective is to determine if the State Department of Education and local school districts are complying with all financial reporting requirements for the Oklahoma cost accounting system. Now, when I took office, I really believed that everyone would know, want to know about the fraud, waste, and abuse and work together to get it fixed. Well, that's not always the case. It's not easy to shine the light of transparency. When things were meant to stay in the shadows, they get exposed. And behind closed doors, people have said, Auditor, you are so brave. Quite frankly, I'm really shocked about that. When did telling the truth and not backing down make someone brave? Isn't it just the right thing to do? I will tell you this, liars figure, but figures never lie. And that's why I love being your auditor. There's no such thing as government funded, it is all taxpayer funded. With government dollars, the taking and spending of money must be done according to statute, and there is an expectation of accountability and transparency. I believe government belongs to the people. It's paid for by your tax dollars. Government entities are only stewards of the people's checkbook. And it's my job as state auditor to make sure that those checkbooks are in order with as much authority as the legislature will give me. And let me close with this. My team and I are working on some big projects. We're auditing the billions of COVID funds that were sent to this state. We're doing a special investigative audit of the State Department of Education. And we're starting part two of the Epic Charter Schools audit. I need to finish what I've started, and I need, to get, I need you to give me four more years. You will find no greater advocate for transparency and accountability than my team and I. Thank you for listening. This has been very long, but I'm happy to take any questions. And you guys thought this was going to be dull. Yeah. Okay. Uh, real quick, uh, we have a guest that has just showed up, and I want to introduce him very quick. Your Attorney General for the State of Oklahoma, John O'Connor, right here. Sir, why don't you just come on here just for a minute, if you would. Well, thank you all very much, and Don, thank you. I want to uh, tell you how pumped I am about your endorsement of me, and, uh, and I won't let you down. I think the, uh, the battles that we have to fight, Cindy's talked about some of them, but um, where I've focused is on protecting our rights as individuals, protecting our rights as a state. I think I've, now I think I've sued the Biden administration more than, on average, one time a month since I've been in office. <clears throat> uh, 
And I love the fact that, you know, uh, practicing law for 40 years, uh, I'm convinced that, that there should be evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that convicts us of what we stand for, right? So when you look at this race, my race, uh, it's a very clear distinction between the candidate you've endorsed, that's me, and my opposition. My opposition has given money to the Biden administration when he ran against President Trump. He gave money to Democrat Brad Carson against Senator Tom Coburn when he was running. He gave money to the Democrat running against First District Congressman Jim Bridenstein, who went on to become our NASA director. So there's never been a clearer choice. It's so funny. I've lived in the same state with him, I mean the same city with my opponent, uh, for all these decades and never knew that he was pro-life. And uh, so uh, some things are all of a sudden happening that, that there's not enough evidence to convict somebody of that. On the other hand, I have the endorsement of the largest pro-life organization in the country, the Susan B. Anthony List. And I'm very proud of that. So one of my great honors is a lawsuit called Planned Parenthood versus O'Connor. And, uh, and I'm all about that. Another one of my great honors is that I get to defend the state of Oklahoma when we come up with, with uh, legislation and the governor signs it and somebody sues us to, to take it out of operation. My office gets to do that. And I'm, I'm very honored to be in that role after 40 years of fighting for private clients to be now working for you and fighting for you. So thank you very much for your endorsement I will live up to it. I will not live, live it, uh, let you down. You've seen in nine short months the same guy that you'll see in the next four years in this office. So please help me on June 28th and bring all your friends to the polls. Thank you. Thank you, again, sir, very much. Thank you, AG O'Connor. Uh, real quick, I just saw he popped in back there. Uh, some guy named Nathan Dom, uh, if you would come up very quick. I've worked with this guy for years, and when I tell you that there's never been a more conservative senator in the state of Oklahoma, it's a fact. It's, he, this guy has maintained, and we always say, we want someone that's a proven leader Folks, it just doesn't get any better than this guy. And so he was endorsed this morning by the Oklahoma Second Amendment Association for the uh, open Senate seat. And Senator Dom, sir, would you just come up here for a minute? I'd appreciate it, sir. Hey, I'll, I'll be very brief. You know, it's an honor to be with you all. I always appreciate everything that OK2A does. Uh, it's been an honor to work with you to advance so many uh, Second Amendment pieces of legislation and liberty pieces of legislation. That's one thing I love about OK2A is you all understand that, yes, the Second Amendment protects all of our other rights, but this is a liberty organization about protecting our rights. So I've been honored to work with OK2A for so many years, but I just wanted to come and personally thank you for the endorsement. Uh, today is 10 weeks from the election. It's coming up here in 70 very quick days. Uh, so I'm honored to have your endorsement. That is a huge endorsement. Very thankful for that. Would be honored to talk with you afterwards if you want to get involved in the campaign. Uh, it is definitely going to be a sprint to the finish, and we are running full speed ahead. So be honored to have your involvement, and thank you for your support and endorsement. God bless you all. Thank you. Okay, uh, Pastor Vineyard was somewhere with the microphone right here. We're going to take questions. I'm going to make it very clear, folks. It's a question. It's not a diatribe, a political philosophy. It's a question related to tonight's uh, uh, presentation. So, Pastor, anyone raise your hand uh, right here. Some, some guy here on the front row wants to. Uh, I notice on OMDOC's website from last year about May, it mentions that during the multi-county grand jury that the attorney general at the time, Mike Hunter, had to recuse himself and have a special prosecutor. Do you have any idea why the AG would not be a part of the actual investigation of Epic at that time? 
Are you speaking specifically about A.G. Hunter? Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm probably not the best first person to answer that question. I think that um, Harris and Cheney donated to every person. Uh, it, it didn't make that person bad for accepting their money, but I, if I were in A.G. Hunter's shoes and I had accepted money through political donations, I probably would have, have appointed a special prosecutor so that the whole investigation was beyond reproach. And I guess that question, again, would be best for A.G. Hunter, but that is an option that attorney generals have. There we go. Hi, my name is David. So I just have some questions for you. Um, in regards to maybe after this investigation is over with epic charter schools, uh, is there any way to prove about the quote unquote misappropriation against you? Maybe, you know, the funds being used against you for slander or libel? I'm sorry, could you hold your microphone closer? Um, is there anything that's going to be done assuming that once the investigation is over and it's proven that it's possibly misappropriated money going to those individuals, is there anything that's going to be done against you for like libel and slander? You mean asking if Harrison Cheney would uh, sue me for libel and slander? Well, no, no. I mean, oh. like them li uh, doing libel and slander against you. Are you going to be doing anything? Oh, am I going to be doing anything? No. I'm your state auditor. I took on this job. I'm strong enough to stand and take the attacks, and, and I really appreciate that I can present the facts. Sure. Thank you for coming tonight. I wanted to ask you, how many children do you have, and is your uh, husband stay-at-home mom while you're gone, or does he accompany you? I certainly hope an auditor can keep a count on kids. <laughs> um, no, ma'am, I do not have children. I could not have children. But I've been blessed with two of the greatest nieces and two of the greatest nephews an aunt could ever ask for. And my sweet, they're actually my great nieces and great nephews, and my niece, who's just a few years younger than me, appreciates all the help I give her in schooling her children. My husband and I do not have children. Um, he does live in Colgate. I'm up here during the week. I do telework a day or two a week, which has you know, been the norm since COVID happened. Um, and I miss him terribly. Whenever I'm here, I really do. Hi, Cindy. Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, my question's involving uh, David Cheney and Ben Harris. When will we see charges and when will we see charges brought against them? And what, if anything, can be done about that? Maybe uh, A.G. O'Connor might have some words as well, but I'd like to see some charges brought against these people. Okay, well, the, the, the short answer to that question is not quick enough. It's been 18 months. But in defense of the Attorney General's office, and D.A. Prater, this is, was an extremely complex scheme that had to be unraveled piece by piece. Um, I believe that charges are coming very quick, very, very quick, and I believe that they're going to be at both the state and the federal level. So you're going to see some things start to happening, I believe. Okay, Reverend Stiegel here. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Jay. So I, I retired out of the Air Force Reserve after almost 23 years. We had three core values. Anybody that's served in that branch knows what they are. Integrity first, service before self, which happens to be my campaign motto, and excellence in all we do. You exemplify those qualities, and it's exactly what we should expect out of every elected official. And for that reason, I want to publicly give you my endorsement tonight. Thank you, Representative Stiegel. I appreciate that very much. Right here. So on the, uh, the uh, student learning fund, the $1,000 that passed to that fund was there. So if that student didn't spend that money, was there any money that ever came from that fund back to Epic? and found its way back? Or was the, was the funds a one-way street and it only went to the, the student uh, fund and never back? 
Short answer, it was a one-way street and no money has ever come back. And let me just um, expand just a little bit on that. The question was, we had the school's general fund and we were taking $1,000 per student every year and putting it into an outside bank account. Over six years, that amounted to $145 million. We never had an accounting of how that money was spent. We've never seen true invoices and no money has ever come back to the school from that. So I just wanted to ask a quick question about, as you were going through the OCPA articles, I think I heard you say that they published something that was said in a private meeting. Is that correct? That is correct. So there was internal knowledge of something that they went ahead and published. That, I mean, can you comment any further on that? I'm just curious. Sure, so anytime we do an audit, there are things that may not rise to the level of a reportable finding, but it's something that we know that that entity needs to get cleaned up or it's going to turn into a more serious finding. While we were doing the audit of Epic Charter Schools, we noticed a, a one issue with retirement. Now, we did report some issues on retirement, but one specific issue on retirement that we only reported directly to the representatives of the school ended up on one of the OCPA articles. And I think beyond that, I think that would be a good question for OCPA and Jonathan Small on how that information got there and how that, that transpired. Mark Hader, County Commissioner, and uh, I'll just one up Mr. Stiegel here by, I believe I was the first elected official in your original campaign to endorse you, so. Anyway, but. Uh, Thank you. But uh, I think in your comments, and one of the concerns I've had is I've wanted, I'm a person that's always been a straight arrow and I want, if there's, something nefarious I wanted uncovered and, and set right. But I don't, what I don't want is for Epic, as far as like the charter school, the, the model of the school separate from what you've accounted here. Uh, I, I don't want to lose that opportunity for parents. And so I'm just curious what your thoughts are. I think you tried to make that distinction and you might elaborate that you know, this is probably more of an indictment on the management company than it is on the charter school itself. Okay. First of all, let me be very clear. I am for school choice. I, I really I don't know how the whole narrative of this audit got turned around to this was an attack on school choice. This audit was about how a private company came in, took over the school's checkbook, and took advantage. Bottom line, period. Um, I think that our actions following the release of this audit prove that we did not try to harm this school in any way and prove that we tried to help them get back into compliance and do things right. And again, I wanna remind you that because of this audit, that school now has $30 million more this year to put into their students and they are aggressively working to graduating high school students with both a high school diploma and a, an associate's degree that's paid for by the school. Back here. Thank you. I'm Scott Esk. I'm running for House District 87, a little, little south of here in Northwest Oklahoma City. I appreciate your presentation tonight. And I very heartily applaud any audit. I think you said that it hasn't been done with the public schools in general. Is that correct? My comment in that Oklahoma? There, there has never been a request for an audit of the State Department of Education quite like Governor Stitt has requested. Okay. Not never in the history of the state has the state auditor's office ever performed this type of audit on the State Department of Education. Well, I would be shocked if you didn't find a lot of rat holes that uh, uh, educrat money was going down. Um, and if you're into, uh, an, if you like the idea of an, a plan B <laughs> rather than an audit, what would you think of the possibility of having a policy where whatever children show up at a school, at a public school, some parent or guardian must personally take responsibility for any expenses they incur and pay whatever fees are appropriate or they just don't go to school. Sir, I would tell you that the auditor's office, we guard our independence very zealously. We stay in our lane. And my job is only to audit what policies our legislators put in place through state statute. So my opinions on how the funding flow should happen with education are not, are not relevant to my position. 
Great job, Cindy. Proud of you. Uh, I'm uh, Jared Kendricks. I'm the representative for Southwest Oklahoma District 52. I'm also a CPA. I've been a CPA, have an accounting firm in Altus, been doing that for a little over 30 years. Uh, so I've sat and listened uh, to this presentation in one form or another over the last two years being a representative and have an insight from the, uh, from the CPA auditing world. And I've been extremely impressed with Cindy and her staff and the process that they've taken in this of not pushing back, but giving the truth, being specific with the truth, showing what the truth is, laying out the facts, uh, and, and, and the, the way in which you all have done that impresses me. Uh, and like I say, having the background, I understand what she's gone through. So as, as a CPA and as a representative, I would second what Jay Stegall said just a little bit ago, that I endorse you. I appreciate what you've done. I look forward to four more years. Thank you, Representative Kendricks. We have a question back here. We're going to take this. We're going to go ahead and make this the last question because people want to go home at some point. All right, go ahead, Ralph. They do. They want to go home. This was pretty entertaining, Cindy. Uh, I just want to thank you and thank the people that have come tonight to listen to your presentation. You hit a grand slam tonight. I just want to ask you with the things that are going around and what you've endured. Have you been offered any security for yourself? Because Quite frankly, they've given security to people for much less, and you have really tolerated a lot over the last year and a half, two years, and I thank God, God has given you the strength to do so. You've done a great, great job. Thanks for being here. Thank you. I would like to answer that question. First, I believe God protects me. Second, I carry a gun in my purse. Proud defender of the Second Amendment. Thank you all very much for sitting through this. It's not often that the auditor can have a captive audience to listen about audits, but I am, I'm going to be here for a little bit. I'm happy to answer any questions you have, and if it's not tonight, you are always welcome to reach out to my office. And please remember, bird is the word in 2022. Thank well, thank you, Auditor Bird. Um, like I say, you may come here tonight, you may have already had an idea of what was going on. Uh, this hopefully answered some questions or at least gave you another side to, of what has been, accu uh, what's been accused of here. Uh, I am pleased, like I say, to have not only the uh, state auditor here, but we've had a number of elected officials here tonight uh, just wanting to see what else is going on with this. So uh, I don't see this ending anytime soon. But that's life, too. So anyway, but folks, uh, I want to thank you guys again for making it here tonight. Uh, if you're not a member of the Oklahoma Second Amendment Association, I don't know what you're waiting on. Uh, we are working uh, at all types of levels on this. And also, I'll remind you again that Josh Reel from U.S. Law Shield is back there in the corner back over there. If you do not have, if you carry a firearm, you need to carry a lawyer. And that would be your lawyer, U.S. Law Shield, in your pocket. So again, uh, I want everyone to safely go home tonight. I appreciate you for being here tonight, and you guys have a good evening. Thank you very much.